At IPC Health, we are leaders in public oral health services. As the largest service provider in the outer west of Melbourne, we provide dental services to the Brimbank, Hobsons Bay and Wyndham local government areas, or LGAs. Our LGAs are currently experiencing a major public oral health crisis, which is getting worse by the day, and we need the funding to fix it. Let's look at the problem. We have less than 50% of the public chairs required to support the demand. Our waiting lists for both adults and children are immense, wait times for general care and denture care are excessive, and we are in one of the fastest population growth corridors in metropolitan Melbourne. On top of this, COVID-19 service restrictions have caused a massive backlog of further delayed treatment. The impact is huge, with thousands of people in our community affected and many of those suffering. While clients are waiting, their health situation gets worse. Many patients require major work and often come to us experiencing pain, inflammation or infection. This poor oral health can impact their overall health due to related comorbidities including diabetes, cardiovascular disease and mental health problems. Our communities have a low socioeconomic background and a high culturally and linguistically diverse percentage and they rely on us for access to innovative and inclusive community health services and solutions. As one of the largest providers in Victoria, we are fully invested, but we can't do this alone. We need government funding to help manage the current crisis and COVID backlog. And we need sustainable and longer term funding models for our rapidly growing population. What if we had the government funding to enable our innovative solutions? IPC Health has a contemporary purpose-built eight room dental facility shell at our Wyndham Vale Superclinic campus. We have committed capital expenditure to fit out the facility with the required infrastructure and equipment to make it operational. We are now seeking the required government funding to support the service delivery that our community so desperately needs. What if we could activate eight dental chairs at our Wyndham Vale campus, engage and support dental students with experienced supervisors? This would allow us to provide dental services to an additional 2,240 people per annum employ additional dentists and employ oral health therapists to provide comprehensive and culturally sensitive education, care and support for improved health literacy and oral care outcomes. With this funding, we could do all these things and support increased throughput and waitlist reduction, deliver patient-centred and value-based care, target at-risk populations and move from treatment to prevention. We need this government funding so we can create healthier communities together. Please contact us for more information. I'd like to see three changes to the way public dental waiting lists are managed. How wait times are reported, what percentage of the eligible population are seen, and to not have publicly owned dental chairs sitting around unused. I can link these nicely together. One. When we point to an organization and say, your wait list is reported to be 19 months long, that does not mean that the person who's receiving a checkup today has been waiting for 19 months. And it doesn't mean that if you put your name on the wait list today, you will finally be seen in 19 months. But since there are so many complexities and exceptions to understanding these numbers in a meaningful way, I would appreciate greater transparency over the reality of the situation for the sake of future advocacy efforts. Two. The public sector only services about 25% of the eligible population in a given two-year period. That statistic hasn't changed much in the last 10 years. We would have to invest a significant amount of public sector time and money into understanding the oral health needs of the other 75% of the population who are eligible but don't utilize public dental services in order to reframe what an equitable care model would look like to cater to 100% of the eligible population, given the current limitations on public dental funding, staff and clinical equipment. Which brings me to my third point. Dentistry doesn't have to be all done in a traditional dental chair, but a lot of it does. Dental chairs are hugely expensive pieces of machinery with their own lifespan. So to know that the public dental agencies have unused, unfunded dental chairs sitting around without enough funding or staff to make use of them seems a real pity. So probably my first move if I was given X millions of dollars for public sector 
dentistry would be to ensure that clinics with unused dental chairs received funding to maximum to run at maximum capacity, not only from nine to five, from Monday to Friday, but also outside business hours and with child minding services. Victoria is not unique in the fact that we have very long public dental waiting lists, but it could be unique in the way we address this significant issue. Hi everyone, uh, this is Tan. Um, I'm a PhD uh, candidate at Deakin Health Economics and um, this is a video just to briefly describe uh, what I think would be a useful uh, approach to preventive models of care for the public sector. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, really is an important focus for public dental services is to think about how we can uh, provide average services to populations who may not necessarily have the means to access dental care um, and often uh, dental care may be the last thing on a person's mind particularly for our priority populations uh, and so uh, I think there's a huge role for the public sector to increase the outreach services um, but also an important focus of preventive public dental care also would involve the optimal use of the whole dental team. So this includes uh, dental nurses or health therapists and, and dentists to work at the top of their scope because uh, I think there can be um, quite significant efficiencies that can be gained by optimal utilisation of the general health workforce. Another thing that would be helpful to strengthen the focus of prevention for public dental services is also to consider how we um, collect data and how we use that data to inform policy decisions uh, and making those uh, that data readily available and also making it um, I guess being able to be explicit in terms of of the data to be transparent and open uh, and I think that will, inc will increase uh, not only uh, activities in and how we can use the data to inform best practice, but also to be as a, a tool, uh, even for decision tool for uh, even uh, dental practitioners on the ground to really understand you know, how well they perform in terms of how well they can provide prevention as a focus uh, in public dental services. Um, and so I think I'll leave it there. Um, of course, there's other models of care that would be helpful to drive prevention. Um, I think um, just briefly discussing the importance of maximising and optimal utilisation of dental teams, I think is something that we really need to consider. And also how best to use data to inform uh, policy decision making moving forward to increase the focus of prevention in Victoria. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Lakana Rabel. I am the senior dentist at the Central Gibson Health Service in State Hospital. Um, sorry, the video keeps shaking. I'm using my hand here, so we'll really test my arm strength here. <laughs> so I do apologize for the video shaking a bit. So one thing that um, I've noticed um, in the past few months working at Central Gibson Health Service is that we've been seeing a quite a high intake of mental health patients. Now, mental health patients are priority patients, which means they have the ability to essentially be seen immediately. And, but what we've also known is that a lot of these mental health patients don't attend their appointments. And that's for a lot of reasons. Um, some it's because they can't come, to, uh, they physically can't attend the appointment because they don't have the facilities such as a car to come their carers are unable to pick them up, for example, or there's issues from that front, there are certain obstacles that are preventing them from physically coming to the appointment. So what happens then is that um, when they're not seen, we're having blocks of time, which we could be seeing a patient. Sometimes we're fortunate that we can be filled with toothaches, but a lot of the times it's not. And these are times where we could be seeing a patient off the general wait list for general treatment. So what happens is that it's um, essentially gets clogged up. Now, I don't have any evidence for this, but anecdotally speaking, it seems that I have seen a more higher intake of mental health patients ever since I've started at Central Cleveland Health Service, which has been four years so far. And there, my suspicions are, or uh, my assumptions are that it'll continue to rise. So my idea is something I've spoken to colleagues about, is by rather than 
essentially creating an environment where they can, um, you know, come to the clinic and then potentially not then make the appointment they're not able to come is that we go out to them and we can work with community health centers or health hubs quantum services for example um, and work with these organizations who can then essentially let and notify us of these types of patients and essentially adopting the model of the central dental benefit scheme creating trucks um, which will allow us to go to these areas and essentially um, either examine these patients at these community health services um, there, which might make it easier for the patient to get to. Um, and then, uh, and by examining them, we can then treatment plan. And then when they come in for the appointment, hope, at, the clinic, at the hospital, um, hopefully it is just that one appointment they need to be seen. So therefore, they can, we can try and do as much treatment as we can to make it a lot more easy for them and reduce them from making multiple appointments, which can reduce them from having multiple chances of not coming to their appointment. Um, so, and then on top of that, my other objective is to train um, some of our other auxiliary staff, that includes our oral health therapist, who at this stage isn't has doesn't have the full adult scope, um, but with certain number of funding can then have that ability to be get that fully extended scope. So they also themselves can then be um, part of the mix of clinicians to go and be part of assessing the um, the mental health clients at these community health centers, um, examine them, create the treatment plan, or at least consult with one of the dentists to create the treatment plan and then get referred. Um, and then they can then make the appointments at the clinic here. And my final goal is to create this truck where we can even do treatment over there as well to make um, things easier for these mental health clients. Um, the other advantage of this area is that the community, the mental health client, my goal is that um, they're, they're carers or their case managers will be there so they are understanding of what we're doing because we have had some instances where there has been some miscommunication which can then result into additional unnecessary appointments which then leads to further clogging of the general wait and general and emergency wait lists um that's my goal so just to kind of recap it's essentially um utilizing a truck or a van going out to these community health centers um, where who look after mental health clients and um, essentially sending clinicians there who will then do exams and checkups, create a treatment plan and then know the number of appointments and then make that number of appointments at our hospital here and um, eventually hopefully uh, creating a truck where we can do treatment at the hospital, uh, at the community service themselves. Um, and then obviously training auxiliary staff to help with examining these patients at these community services and um, help with the program. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to give me a call on 0411 754 151. And um, thanks for listening. Hi, I'm Kent Burgess, CEO here at Your Community Health in Melbourne's North. And I'm here to talk about how we can best utilise increased funding into Victoria's public dental system. To, meet, to reach more Victorians in desperate need of oral health care. For example, here at Your Community Health, we have over 4,000 people on our waiting list for oral health care. And we're reaching more of those people through innovative programs such as our pioneering Heal and Seal program that provides early intervention and disease stabilisation for those people awaiting routine dental care. Such a program could be rolled out across community dental services to help impact waiting times. In addition, if we were to work together at a regional level, we could get access to both public and private dental chairs that are underutilised and have a massive impact on our emergency waiting times for dental care. Whilst we welcome the increase of funding in this budget, we also call on our funders and our elected representatives to ensure that this funding is built year on year so that we can reach the over 4,000 people on our services waiting list alone who are in desperate need of oral health care so that we can get more Victorians smiling again.